Welcome to the Flowering She Rose Budcast, a space devoted to the Divine Feminine rising within each of us. My name is Anahita, and I'm here to bridge plant and human consciousness as we gather in this virtual garden and explore how plants can guide us in our lives as multidimensional human beings. It's my prayer that these personal stories, transmissions, and medicine music may remind you of the sacredness of this magical life and the power that lies in your intuitive nature. We're so glad you're here. Hi friends, it's Anna here and you're listening to episode 3 of the Flowering She Rose podcast. Today's guest is Catherine Soli of Persephone's Path and we're going to talk about poisonous plants and what they have to teach humanity. Just to let you know, we will be talking about subjects such as boundaries and death, but there's nothing to fear because in the end, the message is that through integrating our darkness, we become whole and that in return will make us more alive. Catherine has dedicated her life to the study and practice of non-duality and inner work. She teaches meditation classes and workshops on poisonous plants and various spiritual topics. Catherine also works one-on-one -on -one with people looking to remember their authentic selves. Hi, Catherine. I'm so Hi. glad you're here on the podcast and really excited to dive into poisonous plant medicine with you today. Me too. Hi. I'd like to invite in all plant spirits that would like to use us as a vessel to bring out their message and their teachings to our listeners. May our conversation bring many insights to you today. Mm. Catherine, you are um, a teacher of poisonous plant medicine, and I'd like to start by asking you how you came onto the plant path. Mm. Well, I, when I was um, a kid, I was talking to plants, and which I think is pretty normal. I think that um, if you leave a child unattended outside, they'll just be talking to the elements. But I never really lost that. It kind of stayed with me. I think a lot of kids get the message that that's not real or that's silly. Or if you do that, you're stupid, I guess. <laughs> I think that's kind of how our culture views um, the unseen is it's, if it's not scientific, if it's not quote unquote rational then um, it's stupid. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people lose this really amazing, valuable connection because of that conditioning that comes so early. Um, but for whatever reason, either I just didn't get the conditioning or it was just too, like the connection was just too good <laughs> for me to, to let go. <laughs> it definitely faded um, from when I was like 11 till... I was about 16 and, um, and then it started to come back. Um, cause I was, as a teenager, I was like hanging out in the woods with my friends and remembering, oh yeah, I can like talk to the trees and, um, yeah. And then, and plant medicine, herbalism has come in and out of my life, um, for many years. Uh, when I was about 28, I was, going through my Saturn return and I had moved out back out east where I'm from for after living in Colorado for 10 years and kind of serendipitously found this herb school in Vermont that specialized in plant spirit medicine and they had like one spot left and I saw um, that they were advertising that and signed up for it without really knowing anything about it and and I was just actually there. We had a reunion over the weekend. So it's still kind of, it's fresh in my mind. Um, it's really, it's, it's the Gaia School of Healing in Vermont. And it's really precious, um, sweet school. But yeah, my, I think it was the first day of the second weekend. Um, the, the teacher, Sage Maurer, invited us. It's, the school is on her land. She lives there. And then she has all these beautiful gardens everywhere of just medicinal plants everywhere and um invited us to go sit with a plant that was calling to us and as she was telling us this she was standing in front of her shade garden which is a garden that doesn't need a lot of sunlight 
And um, there's this plant there. I could see behind her and it was like calling, like screaming at me. And I started to feel like panic. Like I have to get over to this plant before anyone else does. I was like, I really have to talk to this plant. It's urgent that I go talk to this plant. (laughs) And I didn't know what the plant was. And um, I went and sat with it and the, its leaves were kind of hard. They weren't really soft and they had little spikes on the edges of them. And it had flowers with these kind of weird seed pods coming out of them. Um, I didn't, again, I didn't know what, what this plant was and I, I went and sat with it. And just immediately, as soon as I sat with it, just got these this imagery of being pulled headfirst down into the center of the plant and then down through its roots and down into the earth and um, coming into this this space of kind of just this empty underworld space and down in the space was this naked old crone archetype who's just laughing and dancing and she was repeating a couple of things over and over to me. And one of them was, this is where you're going to do your work. This is where you're going to do your work. And I uh, took my hands off of the plant. I was like, okay, that was interesting. Okay. What else do you have to tell me? Tell me something else. I, like, I didn't really want to fully hear that or it just wasn't mm-hmm. like, okay. I didn't really realize how, um, impactful that was going to be and um and then she just kept like three times said the same thing this is where you're going to do your work and was just laughing um and then afterwards I found out that the plant is hellebore and it is a poisonous plant um it also goes by Christmas rose it's a lot of people are familiar with it um it has different varieties so it could be it has like a lot of different colors and they um bloom in the winter time which is why they're called christmas rose wow i mean that's such rich imagery that you were getting from this plant and you were sitting next to it and it sounds like you were touching it Mm -hmm. communing with it Mm -hmm. so is this something that happens for you easily if you go someplace with the intention to connect to the plants you hear these messages yeah yeah um that's the way that they come through to me is through kind of like dreamlike imagery and, and sometimes there's words, but it's actually often that there's images and then I put words to them because it's like, it's like the imagery is their language or it's, that's the way that I interpret their language. And then, and then it goes through my filter and goes into English and it's more like the, the level of communication that you're at when you are receiving these revelations is through your heart field, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what's interesting hearing you say that because that's like how ideally I, f- I feel like I move through the world is like my heart is guiding me. And before we recorded, sat down to record this, I've been working in my garden all day and... Um, and I went to go visit a, an elder tree growing in my yard who is just, elder's been a huge teacher for me. And they just pointed to my belly and they said, um, do the podcast from your belly. And I was like, hmm, I, I don't know how to do that (laughs) it's it's a different way of relating yeah it sounds to me like you are a highly sensitive person like you you don't actually need to approach the plants with a certain technique in order to receive these communications Mm. and like it comes more naturally to you and yeah yeah it definitely comes more naturally to me as long as i'm in alignment if i am in kind of a chaotic mind space and come to a plant then the messages aren't going to come through because there's too much going on like it ha- i have to be quiet and um in a more present mindful state then after your first encounter with hellebore how did your relationship with that plant continue and mm. what happened to the message that 
this was your work, poisonous plant medicine. How did that mm -hmm. unfold for you? Well, after I met Halibor, um, you know, I was in this year long herbalism training and I kind of <laughs> lost, not lost interest, but my interest was so in, into the poisonous plants. Like I wanted to, to just follow that stream, um, so strongly. It was just such a strong pull. And looking back now, it makes a lot of sense because, um, I think I've just always been attracted to that kind of vibrational world. Um, even when I was, um, more into Eastern philosophy and, and Buddhism and, um, I was working with the wrathful feminine deities like Kali. They're like the equivalent of poisonous plants in Eastern philosophy's deity realm. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense to me that I would be pulled into um, working with the poisonous plants. It's like a continuation. It's like the same messages through a different vessel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since since meeting the Hellebore, that whole world has just taken over. And meanwhile, you're leading in-person classes and you also have an online course mm -hmm. that has six modules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I just participated in one of the modules that was about foxglove and monkshood mm -hmm. and the witch's flying ointments. Yeah. And I would love to talk a little more about foxglove with you because that was the plant out of all the plants that you covered in the course that has really kind of been calling to me. It's no longer mm -hmm. in bloom here, mm -hmm. but you recently posted or reposted something on Instagram that was a quiz about which poisonous plant are you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and underneath foxglove, it says you, if you love to dance with the fairies Mm -hmm. And if you want to become a doula, then you might be foxglove. And <laughs> that, that was you. actually super interesting to me because mm -hmm. uh, during the shamanic journey that you led in the course, the image that I received for foxglove was a tiny birth canal. And mm -hmm. the flowers are kind of something like something that you can stick your finger into, like the hat mm -hmm. of a finger. Yeah, And they often have little speckles, say like the flower is white, the speckles are red. And the image mm -hmm. that I got was one of a, a tiny birth canal for babies to be birthed that maybe aren't, uh, haven't even reached the level of a fetus yet that are still in their embryonic mm -hmm. stage. Um, souls that are maybe unwanted or aren't ready to incarnate yet. And that connection to to doula really had me spiking my ears because um, yeah, I was wondering if this is a connection that other people have seen as well. Mm, um, it's not something that I've heard before, but when, when you're talking, what it does make me think of that I've heard from people and I've experienced myself is it's kind of, it's like a gateway plant. Um, that foxglove is this plant that is a guardian between worlds. And in some ways, that's how birth is too. It's this gateway between worlds. Yeah, and birth and death and poisonous plants mm -hmm. that have the capacity to kill us. It's kind of the same with the wrath, wrathful deities that are responsible for death and decay, but also rebirth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people in general, I think miss the rebirth part when they think about poisonous plants or wrathful deities, they just see the destruction and so avoid it because they don't want, they don't want to be devoured or killed. When I uh, took Asia Suler's intuitive plant medicine course mm. last year, she had one module that was about finding your plant ally. And this was when I was really just first getting into plant spirit healing and the idea that we can relate to plants on this emotional, spiritual level. And um, 
my plant ally for the duration of the course actually ended up being um, a highly poisonous plant called Daphne Mesoreum. Mm. And uh, she is so poisonous that you could even hurt your skin if you touch her. But her flowers are mesmerizing. And um, I met her in Austria when I was on vacation with my daughter and her father. And it was just the beginning of April, but she was already in bloom with her sweet pink flowers that were so rich that they almost smelled like vanilla. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know at this point who this plant was or that she was so highly poisonous. I found all of that out afterwards, but um, I was kind of analyzing that scene, what was going on when I met her. And um, I remember being so joyful about having a plant that smelled so good and that looked like sh she should be blooming in full summer, even though there was still snow on the mountains. Mm. But at the same time, there was this tightness inside of me because my daughter's father, whom I haven't been in a partnership with for several years, was also kind of on the periphery of my vision. And I was feeling like I wanted to be so joyful and light and beautiful, but ah, at the same time, it didn't feel safe to be that way. And in the end, what I what I got from this plant is still something that I need to learn if to, mm -hmm. to not dim my light, I'd say. Yeah, I really resonate with that. Um, so I'm not familiar with this plant that you're talking about, but I'm not at all surprised that its lessons are on boundaries since it's a poisonous plant. They seem to just go hand in hand. Have you had any experiences where poisonous plants have taught you lessons about boundaries? Yes, <laughs> like <laughs> so many. Um, yeah, um, the first thing that comes to mind is poison ivy which has really has not been an ally for me until this year um, where it's just everywhere. I just am seeing it everywhere and um, I keep having to lovingly remove it from my garden. Um, and anytime I go for a hike or I go to the beach or I go to try to har wild harvest some medicine, poison ivy's there. Um, and boundaries have been one of the more difficult lessons of my life, um, being a more um, energetically sensitive being. It's just whatever's going on, I have historically just been like a sponge, you know, um, hard for me to differentiate what am I feeling versus what are the people around me feeling. Like I'll think, I'm feeling a certain way and then someone leaves the room and I'm like, oh, no, 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 that was, <laughs> it was, I was feeling something that they were feeling. Um, yes. Yeah. I know what, it, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, you can relate. And I've just heard from, for years and years from so many people, oh, just visualize yourself in a bubble of light or um, even like wrap your body up in rows and and um, the thorns will protect you. Oh, yeah. I use that visualization mm. too. And <laughs> that, it feels really good. And it just like wasn't enough for me. Um, but when I met Poison Ivy and I imagined being wrapped up by Poison Ivy, it was like almost like a boa constrictor, but in a, not in a, where it's killing me way, but just, um, but just in how tight it was, how there was no cracks whatsoever between the vine, just being completely protected and wrapped up by this vine so that nothing could penetrate it. And not only could nothing penetrate it, but it also was protecting me from reaching out and trying to sense what was going on around me, because that's also, that's probably been the biggest lesson around boundaries that I've learned this year. Yeah, I think that's a way of looking at boundaries that isn't actually often talked about. Usually it's like you need to have your boundaries set up so that other people's energy can't come in so that you can kind of protect yourself. But we also, as highly sensitive persons, sometimes need to protect ourselves from our own tendency to 
to extend our feelers and our antennae because it's naturally so easy for us to feel into what's going on for another person, to gather information about their situation. And um, so, it, yeah, in that sense, also protecting ourselves from ourselves and from our own abilities and just staying centered and with what's going on for us purely. And then when the time is right and you're serving someone else by doing deep listening or working as a practitioner, then of course is the time to open yourself up and close the container afterwards and make sure to just practice energetic hygiene. And a third way I find in which these poisonous plants can teach us about boundaries has to do with the ratio, with the relationship between boundaries and shining brightly, not dimming to fit in. I personally, for as long as I can remember, when I walk past a male being in the streets, I can sense myself shutting down. I feel my energetic body contracting and I feel awkward. I, especially when I know that I'm like at the height of my cycle and my skin is just really radiant and um, I have that natural glow to me, um, there's an added layer to it. Something deep inside of me that is like, it's not safe. And this is where Daphne Mesoreum comes in. The plant that I've chosen for today is Plant Spirit Transmission. Daphne, can I fully enjoy my senses with him around? Can I be my fairy self, happy and free and fluttery with him around? Can I be my Daphne, intoxicatingly rich and sensual beauty with him around? Can I be turned on like a bee with him around? Inner freedom and a field of radiance so strong that all unwanted energies are pushed to the edge of my perception, allowed to be, but not in resonance with me. Exotic rich beauty requires strong boundaries. Were she not poisonous to the mere touch, she would be picked as the most fragrant, unusual one showing herself in April. But she's not there for man to be picked. She's there for the bees. Her sensuality is for the delight of the wider ecosystem. Her role as a forebearer of spring and summer days is clear. She dazzles our eyes with her unlikely appearance. And she is not for touch. She is not for food. She is not for you. She is for the birds too, some of which can feast on her red peppercorns later in the year. But that's another story waiting to be explored. Daphne. Teach me of your beauty and your boundaries. Which one comes first? And are they in sync? Mm, I'm sure there are other women out there who have the similar experience as I. And I would love to know if this exercise of visualizing a beautiful poisonous plant surrounding you when you ever feel like dimming your light like it's not safe to be your sensual beautiful self in front of the masculine then let me know how it goes let me know which plants you choose for this i'd be very curious to hear from you this type of uh, poetry or transmission is something that i'm just experimenting with and and i'm also open to contributions from my listeners Perhaps you're also feeling inspired to channel your relationship with, uh, with the plants into art. And I would love for this podcast to be more than just a solo project. I would love for it to be a community, a collaboration, and for myself to be a curator. So this is a shout out. If you'd like to send me your work, even just if just to be witnessed and not published, then I'd be thrilled to hear from you. And you can reach me by email, anahita at floweringshe.com. And we're back to our conversation with Catherine Soli. 
Catherine, when you talked about your experiences as a child of talking to plants, I was reminded of some moments that I had with my daughter. She's turning four soon. Mm -hmm. um, in the past year, we had a couple of scares because she, um, we thought she had ingested poisonous plants. Mm -hmm. And um, one time I had turned my back on her while we were picking blackberries up in the fields. And of course she was kind of copying the way that mama's interacting with the plants. And uh, after we had left, I realized that the plant that she was looking at and perhaps touching was one of the family that looks like carrot or a queen Anne's lace mm -hmm. or possibly hemlock. Mm -hmm. And I just was up late that night. Uh, and once you start reading about it um, online, of course, that makes things worse. Mm -hmm. The other time we were in a friend's garden and she had put some cherry laurel in her mouth. Mm -hmm. And the internet told me that five to six seeds of these are enough to poison an adult and possibly kill them. And I, and these are little berries that um, I thought were like cranberries that had like tiny, tiny seeds in the middle until eventually I found out that the seed is actually almost the size of a cherry pit. And so mm -hmm. then I knew for sure that she hadn't swallowed any seeds. Mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, I asked myself, what is the meaning of all of this? There, there's one element to it where her dad and I are obviously going through some trust topics where he's like, well, this is only happening when you're with her because you're not watching mm -hmm. her as well as I am. And I'm like, well, I think she's a hedge witch who's going through her own mm -hmm. initiations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Being very intuitive, I knew that she was fine. Anyways, what this whole thing taught me, though, is that this is maybe not to be taken so lightly, this, this plant path. And I was wondering what you would recommend, how our listeners could start connecting with poisonous plants so that they're not faced with um, what I was faced, basically. It's, it's got me thinking, actually, hearing you say this, well, so... Most of the deaths that I've read about from poisonous plants are from children eating, you know, just not knowing what they're eating, especially with something like belladonna, where I've never tasted a belladonna berry, but that they are allegedly have a sweetness to them. Um, but it can only take, you know, three to six berries to, to kill a, a small child. Yeah. So there is that need to be to be cautious, but there haven't been a lot. Um, that I've found of accidental poisonings that people have had. Not to say that you should be eating poisonous plants, but that the fear there is uh, a little overblown. Yeah, probably way less deaths than f from traffic. Yeah, or, or pharmaceuticals, like kids thinking this is candy or something, you know, that's probably a million times more likely than your child eating a poisonous plant. Most poisonous plants don't taste good. They're really bitter. Um, so kids don't want to eat them. But it makes me think too about this like fear of poisonous plants, which I think is healthy. And I think that there's a, a fear, an ancestral fear, fear from the witch trials and um, you know, there's so many names for these poisonous plants that have to do with the devil. Um, you know, it's basically saying like, stay away from this plant, um, which probably has the purpose to keep children away from it. If it's called devil's berries, um, you know, you get the message, oh, this is a bad mm. plant. I want to stay mm -hmm. away from it. But I think it was also um, those names came from don't go to your ancestral plants don't go to your ancestral entheogenic lineages um, because now Christianity is here and you can't do that anymore um, and if you do then you'll be hung you'll be hanged or or burned or burned. you know whatever horrible torture that they had that's something that's come out of this work that I wasn't expecting I think Laura Valeda Vesta 
calls it the witch wound that, you know, those of us of European descent have this fear and this wound around our ancestors, whether they were actually involved in the witch trials or not, they were still living in Europe during a time when that was happening. And it was, it wasn't safe anymore to practice plant medicine or to practice folk medicine. And it's not just people of European descent, like that's obviously a famous historical event with the witch trials, but um, it's, it's in every culture and it still happens now. There's a lot of cultures that you can be killed for if you're found out to be a witch, whatever that is supposed to mean. Um, so I think that that fear of poisonous plants, it's also, it's, it's valid. And I have to like constantly tell people like, don't ingest these plants. Um, it's not a good idea. It's not safe. Um, but I think the fear is also comes from trauma, um, from that unprocessed trauma that has been passed down for a long time. And perhaps also a fear of this darkness that you spoke about that, space that you went into mm -hmm. when yes. you met Hellebore, the the underworld. Yeah, we're we're really as a culture, uh afraid of the word trauma. You know, even in like spiritual communities that are supposed to be accepting and loving, it's all just light and love, namaste, just focus on the positive and you'll get positive. If you have a disease or an illness or something negative happens, it's because of your karma or a thinking pattern or it's like this really dualistic thinking that avoids half of life, which is this unconscious realm, this, you know, that we all have trauma, we all have shadows we all have these things that have happened in our lives and these parts of ourselves that we are afraid of or might have difficulties when we call them to mind but that without that other half of life then the light and love is empty and um dull it's like a dull light the people that I know who really embody that light and love quality the most are the ones who are most comfortable working in that shadow world and that darkness and that underworld realm, unconscious, not afraid to, to see the, the dark side, quote unquote, of, of life. Our humanness, our pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, humanness. That's just what it is. And so when, when we talk about this fear of darkness and fear of, of, of poisonous plants, I also see it as this fear of the feminine. Yeah. What, all of what we're talking about right now is, I think, the most prominent message of the poisonous plants for us. And I think it's why there's like a little mini resurgence of them happening right now. Um, but with that the, the flavor of the feminine um, belladonna or deadly nightshade that is to me the best plant I've ever met for healing wounds of the feminine, whether you identify as male or female or non-binary, we all have wounds of the feminine because of the world that we're living in is not not um, supportive of feminine energies and every time I lead a journey with Belladonna almost everyone there without me telling without prompting this message gets that message from Belladonna of of needing to to embody more feminine energy within themselves when you say that you're leading a journey for other people what does this look like so I have a drum and I'm drumming and singing for most of the journey. At the beginning, I'm, I'm guiding through meditative techniques, speaking and helping people relax their physical body, their emotional body, their thinking mind and connecting to the earth and connecting to spirit. And then we move into this, this drumming and singing and just welcoming in the spirit of whatever plant that we're working with. Um, and, I, that's my favorite part of teaching actually um, is getting to hear about the journeys that people have because everyone has these amazing, beautiful journeys that are just so in line with my experience of the plants. There are just all these really common themes that come up for people that it still is so amazing to me that 
so many people experience the same plant in the same way or very similar way kind of through their own lens but really the same the same language the same way it's amazing and i was wondering whether in your experience it makes a difference whether people are ingesting the plant through a flower essence or um, just calling in the spirit of the plant i'm so glad that you asked this (laughs) (laughs) Because especially working with poisonous plants, we can't ingest them. You can do a flower essence, um, but obviously you can't like have a tea or, I mean, you can under certain special circumstances, but people listening to this don't ingest poisonous plants, period. Just don't do it. But um, we can have essences. Another way to work with poisonous plants is through topical ointments or oils, and that's a bit safer. Um, but my emphasis is is not none of that. Um, the the essences are wonderful, and I work with essences a lot. Um, but just calling in the spirit of the plant is what feels. Mm, the best to me because it's accessible to everyone. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to even have the plant physically near you. You can do it anytime, anywhere, wherever you are. If you're sitting, if you're quiet, when you are in that space and welcoming in a plant spirit into your consciousness, into your space, you can receive its medicine just through the spirit. You don't need to ingest it. You don't need to be in the same vicinity as the plant. You can just call to the spirit and it works its medicine through you in that way. It does. And um, when you were leading the journey with foxglove, it was actually a very visceral experience for me. I noticed my heart pounding Mm -hmm. uh, and quickening and learned later on that foxglove is heart Mm -hmm. medicine Mm -hmm. or heart poison, depending on the dose. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I love that. And um, I think when we start working with uh, our intuition, um, we can easily doubt Mm -hmm. uh, and wonder whether we're just making things up. Yeah. When your students ask you, like, how do I, how can I distinguish whether I'm actually communicating with a plant spirit or if I'm making that up, what would you say? Mm. It can be hard, difficult to, at the beginning, to be able to tell the difference. Um, Some things to look out for where I would guess this is your mind, it's not the plant, is if it's, if the plant is telling you things outside of yourself, giving you messages about other people. The plants, in my experience, they always want to take us back towards ourselves, back towards into ourselves and show us things about ourselves. Um, Sometimes they'll want to tell us things about the world and sometimes about other people. But if you're just beginning, they're probably not going to choose you to be the messenger for someone else. If there's a feeling of some kind of... um, mm, it's hard to explain this, but it's like an egoic sense of pleasure um, <laughs> where mm-hmm. it's like, yes, like I'm getting something. I'm getting something out of this. Um, it's just building up my ego. If it's something where it's like building up a personality, if that's probably not coming from the plant. Um, you know, the plant might be showing you imagery of of a shaman or something. Um, and then you're like, oh, that means that I'm a shaman and I should start, you know, being a shaman now um you know like your first journey with a plan or something Uh, on the other hand i've heard that um if you are on the path of being a medicine woman medicine man or shaman that uh, the plants will initiate you and and Mm -hmm. in some cultures um you're actually only allowed to work with a plant once it's come to you in your dreams for example right i've also heard that um if what you are hearing or seeing is very critical of yourself and, and negative mm. that uh, mm-hmm. or harsh that it's also a sign that it might be your mind. Um, now I'm wondering if this also applies to poisonous plants. Yeah. So my experience is that I've never felt like the plants were mean. 
or harsh, mm-hmm. but that but they might be showing me something like that I don't want to see or hear. Um, but they're doing it in this, like for Datora, for example, I always experience Datora as this sweet, loving grandmother who's just showing me like, oh, like, you know, you have this trauma in here and that's there and that's okay. Like, we're going to have to process that at some point. And, but it's never like you're bad or, or look at this stupid thing that you did or anything like that. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a red flag for sure. And at the same time, if these plants have a sort of Kali vibe, then Mm -hmm. I can imagine that some of them won't be all just as gentle as Grandmother Mm -hmm. Datura. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's true. Um, If a plant has like an intense message for us, it won't just give us that message when we're not ready. Um, I've had personally and heard a lot from my students that sometimes a plant will just be like, you're not ready to work with me. Come back later. (laughs) It's just not the right time. Or so I think that they're not going to overwhelm us. They're not going to like re-traumatize us. Um, But I've definitely had very intense imagery come up. Um, Even just my, my first journey with henbane, um, which is a poisonous plant and probably the plant that's like the most kind of, underworldy kind of energy um yeah my very first journey was just seeing piles of dead bodies and um having sex on top of these piles of dead bodies and swimming in pools of blood and all these things that would be probably really horrifying to a lot of people um but because I had been working with with wrathful deities before it I knew it was symbolic it wasn't like literally like I want to be having sex on top of a pile of dead bodies (laughs) but um yeah that that can be that kind of imagery comes up a lot and then they're you know they can show us things from our past or traumatic events or kind of remind us of of something and and just remind us you know it might be time to look at this it might be time to heal this and that can be really difficult to see but I've never um experienced where they were like mean about it. Um, they might call you out on things, but it's not coming from this like mean place. It's coming from a loving place. Even with with Kali, for example, um, Kali's you know just chopping off heads and has this necklace of skulls or severed heads, and but her face is peaceful. She's she's coming from love. She's coming from this place of presence and um, groundedness. And it's not like, I think that can be a misinterpretation a lot that it means that you're supposed to be angry and like chaotic and destroy. And But Kali's not like that. She's changing things through this, this peaceful, loving place. And that's, for me, the same experience of the poisonous plants. They're not these evil, mean, scary spirits. They're, they want to help us transform. They want to help us process trauma. And they're doing it from a really gentle, loving place. It's just the imagery can be overwhelming at times, but it's not because the plant is trying to harm us. It's because they're trying to help us. <laughs> and I think the the degree to which this um, dark imagery can disturb us really has to do with how comfortable we are with death as mm-hmm. as part of life. When I was um, doing the journey with Foxglove and seeing this image of a, of a tiny birth canal for mm. tiny beings to pass through, mm. yeah, first of all, I think that what, what this image is, is bringing about is for us to learn to accept that death is a part of life and and for me personally the message was it had to do with boundaries because um i got pregnant when i was 24 and um it wasn't planned and i didn't really know what i wanted to be doing in life at that point and i decided to 
not have an abortion, but I remember talking to the spirit of the baby inside of me and saying, it's okay if you decide to change your mind, you can leave. Because mm -hmm. I don't think that your father and I will be together for the rest of your life. Um, I already had that whispering feeling inside of me. And I remember having a dream before even finding out that I was pregnant, where I was told that I had this baby inside of me and it was connected to the center of my hand. So kind of my heart space. But if I chose to, I could go jogging and lose the baby, mm. which looking back is actually a way more literal dream than I knew at that point. Um, I've read in some articles about fertility that if you want to increase your chances of having a child, then you're not supposed to go jogging in the second half of your cycle. Um, and Foxglove's message for me at this point was you are allowed to have such strong boundaries. If you had had the boundaries that I can teach you about now back then, then you would probably not have birthed this child. And mm. this for me was also connected to grief around my heart. Um, I, and I cried in that moment. These moments of regretting motherhood have been coming up. So this is like my personal struggle in a way, but at least I know that from now on, I have these plants in my life that are teaching me about boundaries. Not, not to paint a, a terribly dark picture, like my daughter is a presence of light and, and I love her. And at the same time, I have these feelings of struggle and, and that's life, right? Mm -hmm. It can be two things at the same time. And, and that's, I think that's what these plants can teach us is there's light in the darkness, there's darkness in the light. I really appreciate you sharing that. And I think most people are afraid to, first of all, speak that out loud, but even admit that to themselves in their mind. I actually feel the Torah's spirit here now. Um, mm, just saying that, that that that's okay, that that's, yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about, holding the light and the dark together, holding like the gift that your daughter is and that things would be different now. Sometimes I'll just sense, oh, Detour is here with me. Detour is usually the one that's there with me. Um, uh, I feel like tears come up when I think about that. I just having this like loving spirit with me of Detora as I go into these difficult places in my psyche that are really painful to go into, but knowing that and being held that Detora has literally got my back, is literally there standing beside me. Wow, Detura, Moonflower. This is actually the perfect moment for me to introduce today's medicine song to you. It's by Marie Sue. And Marie just released her newest album last month in June, and it's called Grief in Exile. And her cover art actually has Datura Moonflower on it. And I know that from her Instagram that she has a really close relationship with this plant. And the song that I chose to feature today actually has Foxglove in the lyrics. And it's called Love Like Water.
Love Like Water by Marie Sue. Thank you so much, Marie, for letting us feature your song today. For those of you who'd like to know more about Marie, I, I wanted to share part of her bio. Marie Sue was raised in a small gold mining town in Northern California and is of indigenous and Polish Hungarian ancestry. She prefers to be known as an abstract storyteller and a voice for the natural world and trials of humanity through song. For the past 10 years, she's been sharing songs she often hardly remembers writing and explains them more as gifts passing through from the creator. She deeply values the medicinal qualities of music and believes that gathering to share her songs is ultimately for healing purposes. Her music has been described as medicinal, hallucinatory, and deeply emotional with a trance-like perfor trance -like performance. I agree. I listened to her album and at some point was just found weeping because it opened something up in me. And I, I, I think that is the amazing, amazing quality that music has to heal and open us up on such deep levels. We have a few more minutes left with Catherine, and there's actually one more topic that is so important to me that I wanted to talk about. You brought up earlier the witches, and I feel so much anger and grief when I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to have the plants help me shift my consciousness and open some doors. And the only... <sighs> The only things that, that are here for us to use, in, in my awareness, are plants or mushrooms that come from different parts of the world. And here I am immersed in a nature reserve area, and there are so many plants surrounding me, and I'm like, what did my ancestors use? Obviously, every culture had medicine women and medicine women who, who were the oracles for the community, and they would use plants or fungi to go into the other realms and come back with messages of what was necessary for healing, either for another individual or for the community at large. And yeah, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. So many. <laughs> um these lineages, you know, when, when Christianity came in, which I don't have an issue with Christianity at all, um, but the historical way that it was used to oppress indigenous people, that I have a problem with. Um, but when Christianity came in and said, you can't use these plants anymore, you can't, you, you can't worship these gods or deities anymore, you can't do these practices anymore, um, that lin those lineages got broken, um, got lost. And, you know, those of us of European descent, I think a lot of people think we have no shamanic lineages, but it's mm -hmm. just that it's been broken for longer, you know, and we can, luckily we do have these surviving um, cultures from, from South America and different places where um, the shamanic lineage is more intact um, but I, I believe every single place on the planet, not I believe it's like I know mm. in my in my soul that we all, no matter where you're from, have the shamanic lineage. And sadly, a lot of them is, but have been just lost and broken. And I it's my hope that they're getting rebuilt. I know it's gonna take lifetimes to rebuild them. Um, but we have little slivers, like I suspect that the idea of witches flying ointments, I think that that was likely a, a shamanic lineage that got lost, um, which is witches flying ointments are these ointments made from plants like belladonna and mandrake and um, henbane and datura and um, all kinds of, of poisonous psychoactive plants um, that when you apply them topically, you have a kind of psychedelic experience at an in a certain way, it's different than taking like psilocybin or, or something like that. But, but they're called witches flying ointments because they give you the sensation of flying, which I think they used that for astral projection. Um, but anyway, that we have like these tiny little crumbs left, but I think it can be rebuilt. I think that we can remember what was here before um, it was all destroyed. 
um, when I was sitting there today and I'm, I'm asking, how can we bring this information back? There are few records out there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have any elders to turn to. The answer was direct communication, direct revelation with the plants, mm -hmm. the same way that our ancestors at some point also received the information from the plants many, many yes. generations ago. I mean, someone had to start, right? And mm -hmm. it wasn't through trial and error. Yes. Oh, my God. That drives me crazy when people say that. I'm like, people are just <laughs> poisoning themselves constantly and dying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I'm like, I'm like clapping. I want to, if we weren't on the podcast, I'd be clapping <laughs> with what you're saying. Yeah. Speaking to the, the plants teach us that there are teachers. We can, we can help rebuild this through, yeah, through what the plants have to tell us. Yeah. So I could also talk about this all day with you, but I think it's time to come to mm -hmm. a closing. And I would I love for you to let our listeners know where they could find you and what your offerings are. Yeah. Um, so I am, I'm on Instagram a lot. Um, my, my name is Persephone's path. Um, Persephone is in the Greek goddess of springtime and the queen of the underworld. Um, my website is just my name, katherinesoli.com, and I teach um, a six-week online course about poisonous plants. Um, I also teach um, here and there one-day, four-hour workshops around poisonous plants. Um, I'm going to be doing some workshops in August in Denver, Colorado at Ritual Craft about poisonous plants and the Persephone myth. And, um, and also be doing a little webinar with the American Herbalist Guild in September. And that's free to the public as long as you're there live. Um, but yeah, and I, I do other kinds of work. I'm not going to, I do like a million things. I'm not going to list them all here, but there's a lot of different ways to work with me. You can work tarot readings and one-on-one -on -one sessions with me as well. So, so multifaceted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's been really, really lovely speaking to you. Mm. Would you like to speak a little closing prayer for us? Sure. Um, so just taking in a deep breath and just thanking all, all of our poisonous plant friends that came through during this, this discussion and the messages um, just remembering that it's okay to have darkness. It's okay to have trauma. It's okay to have parts of ourselves that we don't like. And this is just a part of being human. And the more that we can love these parts of ourselves and go towards them instead of hiding from them, the more that we truly become who we are and regain our power thank you thank you and thank you for taking the time to be here today if you enjoyed the show the best way that you can support us at this point is to let all of your friends know i have a pretty small circle on instagram at this point about 90 people so share tell your friends and until next time